I recently went on a road trip through Death Valley National Park. Death Valley holds the record for the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. On my drive, however, I could only think about one thing. Thank God for air conditioning. Humans get hot, but humans are also pretty smart, so inventions to help you cool down have been around since the automobile itself. This mostly included a series of vents to allow fresh air into the cabin. Take for instance this 1950s Ford Thunderbird, this 1972 Postal Jeep, or even this 1987 Yugo's front hood scoop. That's right, it's not for the engine air. That's for the driver and the passenger. Vents are an easy solution. Some went with smoker windows as well. Tiny little corner windows that could open separate from the main window. You may now stamp your bingo card if you had smoker's windows in a vehicle that you've owned. The most gimmicky remedy came in the 1930s. You'd fill a tube with water and as it would evaporate, it would transfer the heat and, in theory, bring cooler air into the cabin. They were popular in desert climates due to the fact that they cooled the air better the lower the humidity there was. They worked for about 100 miles or so before warming up to match the normal hot temperatures. Although they went out of style in the 1950s, you can still find some companies that will remanufacture them. Packard was the first company to officially offer factory installed air conditioning back in 1940. Before and even way after this time, you could get aftermarket AC installed by the dealership after you purchased the vehicle or by your buddy Jimmy Notos behind the five and dime. I would not recommend that way. But Packard saved you the trouble and did it before the car was even sent your way. Air conditioning was a big luxury, but it was short lived. Since only a year later, the United States was dragged into World War II and manufacturing luxury cars was almost completely stopped. After the war was over, car makers started looking into this invention again, and well, the rest is history. But now, we have to talk about R12 versus R134A. This video essay series mainly focuses on car tech from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, so we have to talk about R12. Back in my day, air conditioning was much colder than the crap we get in today's cars. Actually, he's not wrong. Cars used to use a refrigerant called R12. R12, also known as Refrigerant 12 or Freon, is a chemical with the ugly name of dichlorofluoro. Chromethene. Ugh. We're just gonna call it R12. So behind me is a 1985 Chevy Cavalier wagon and it still runs on R12. So I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you guys what a canister of R12 looks like. This is it. Now this is the little fill nozzle that you would use to fill this car up with the R12. It basically looks like a little propane tank. I had never seen one of these. This car was built 12 years before I was even born. And so for those of you curious, this is what R12 looks like. Don't breathe this. R12 can change states of matter and carry heat more efficiently than water can. It also has a low boiling point, allowing evaporation to occur easier. It's non-corrosive, it's odorless, it's soluble in oil, and it won't hurt rubber components. However, there is a drawback. 
Due to the chemical makeup of R12, it's also really good at cutting through the ozone layer in our atmosphere. Leaked R12 can travel anywhere from 15 to 30 years and can rise from 9 to 15 miles above Earth's surface, destroying ozone molecules on its way. The short-winded answer? It was causing global warming. As pretty of a sight this is, this is where I was sitting while writing this part of the script, and I can't imagine wanting to hurt a planet this pretty. The government and the world decided to do something about it in the late 1980s, called the Montreal Protocol. 75 countries joined the act immediately, with worldwide goals of no longer using R12 by the year 2000. Additionally, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments outlawed the production of R12 by 1995. And you know what? It worked. Over 30 years later, scientists have noted that the ozone layer is actually healing itself now that fewer CFCs are being released into the atmosphere, and it's expected to be back to its pre-1980 strength between 2050 and 2070. As much as I dislike the government intervention when it comes to car making, they actually did something right this time. But what about air conditioning? With no more R12, how are we supposed to cool our cars down? Well, a new chemical was developed, R134A. R134A is 95% less harmful to the ozone layer, while still working as a way to cool the air down. However, it isn't as efficient as the old R12 Freon. So yes, today's AC systems aren't as good at cooling you down as the old systems were before the 1990s. And let's be honest, R134A doesn't quite roll off the tongue as well as R12 did. This also poses a huge problem for cars that used R12. How do you recharge it? Well, it's hard to. Some people convert the systems to accept the new R134A. Some collectors also hold on to old cans of R12 like it's gold, and it might as well be. I've also heard of people using Dust Off, the electronic cleaner, to fill their R12 systems, but that sounds on par with the saran wrap windows and duct taped bumpers. Another option is propane. Now, <laughs> I can't stress this enough. I am not telling you to do this. But I have heard of people using propane in place of R12 due to its similar cooling effect. I work in propane and propane accessories. But now, moving forward. Unlike most topics I talk about, automotive air conditioning is still being used and enhanced to this day. It's come a long way since its conception in the early 20th century, but with the advancements like auto climate, dual and tri-climate zones and even cooled seats, the story is still going on. I wonder what they'll think of next. Do you remember R12? Did you have a window cooler filled with water? Let me know in the comment section down below. I hope you guys enjoyed my latest essay. I also have a new sticker available based off of these essays. If you agree with me that cars were better in the 1980s, this one is a must. If you have any suggestions for topics in the future, please leave them down below. 